Welcome one and all to a bonus piece of content. Today I'm going to be reading to you some quotations from the Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solhenitsyn and a little bit of inter my personal interpretation of it and what I got from it. Now why am I actually doing this? The reason I want to be focusing more on these particular quotations and I, I suppose real interesting things that I got from the book is that for me, these really speak to me and I find some deep wisdom in them. And they're also very good for pieces of content that allow me to link it with other other books or other ideas. Now, if you want to know, I guess, the the general, my general opinion of the book, go and see the book review that I actually did of it. This is going to be a little bit different where I'm going to read out quotes and then afterwards I'll speak a little bit about them and what I found interesting from them. So let's kick it off. Arrests rolled through the streets and apartment houses like an epidemic. Just as people transmit an epidemic infection from one to another without knowing it, by such innocent means as a handshake, a breath, handing someone something, so too they passed on the infection of inevitable arrest by a handshake, by a breath, by a chance meeting on the street. For if you are destined to confess tomorrow that you organized an underground group to poison the city's water supply, and if today I shake hands with you on the street, that means I too am doomed. What Solhenitsyn is talking about here is the epidemic of arrest that followed the October Revolution in 1918-1919 in communist Russia or now known as communist Russia. What's really interesting from this is I suppose his analogy to an epidemic and a plague. It was just something that happened out of the blue. You had no idea what it was coming, what it was going to do and how it would affect you. If we think to times nowadays with the coronavirus and I guess the feeling we all had when it was just starting to kick off in April, April-ish, we didn't really know how serious it was going to be. We didn't know what was going to happen. This is, I guess, the same sort of sentiment, the same sort of feeling. But with him, it was obviously human driven of people coming, taking someone and them, they're gone. They're just swallowed up by the system. They are now in the archipelago, the Gulag archipelago. So I, I found that analogy very interesting just to, to realize not only can this feeling that we've all had an experience now with the coronavirus can be caused by humans as well and the systems that we create. One random little document was published from the many volumes of the hitherto concealed case history of forced repatriation to the Soviet Union. After having remained unmolested in British hands for two years, they had allowed themselves to be lulled into a false sense of security, and they were therefore taken completely by surprise. They did not realize they were being repatriated. They were mainly simple peasants with bitter personal grievances against the Bolsheviks. The English authorities gave them the treatment, reserved in the case of every other nation for war criminals alone, that of being handed over against their will to captors who, incidentally, were not expected to give them a fair trial. They were all sent to destruction on the archipelago. The American authorities did the same. In Bavaria, as well as on the US territory, they delivered tens of thousands of Soviet citizens to a cruel fate, turning them over to the Soviets against their will. In many cases and many books and many stories in general, it's very easy to just point the finger at one person, at one thing as the bad guy. Oh, Stalin was the one. He created this whole system. He created the suffering that killed millions and millions of people. Oh, it was the Bolsheviks. Oh, it was the October revolutionists. Oh, it was the communists. What I find interesting in this was he also pointed the blame at others who deserve the blame. In this case, the Americans, the Germans, the, uh, the British who not only did not help these people when they're in desperate need, these, these outcast Russians, but forced them back into a system where they knew they were going to be just annihilated, crushed in, in the machinery that was the, the, uh, the Stalinist era of, of prosecution. What's really hard is obviously the political aspect of this. The English and the, and the Americans were trying to appease Stalin in a way to, to make sure that everyone was getting on friendly because once the Germans were defeated, now it was time for the other powers to be looking over their shoulders at the people who were their allies and realize, okay, they're my allies at the moment, but very quickly they can be my enemies. 
So just an interesting little tidbit there where he dives into a point where it's 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 good to see that nuance. Not not only were the Russians to blame for for what happened with their whole system and how it was created, uh, but other people played a, a part in it by turning a blind eye, by not looking directly at what was happening there and just believing the stories that were coming out from the Stalinist Russia, the, the Iron Wall, the Iron Curtain. In addition, there was evidently one other circumstance. As always, Stalin did not pronounce that final word and his subordinates had to guess what he wanted. Thus, like a jackal, he left himself an escape hole so that he could, if he wanted, beat a retreat and write about dizziness from success. After all, for the first time in human history, the calculated torture of millions was being undertaken, and even with all his strength and power, Stalin could not be absolutely sure of success. One of the things you'll hear some people who support communism or, or Stalinism or whatever sort of ism it is, is that they'll say, but there's no evidence, there was nothing here to prove that this happened. And while that may be true, there can actually be reasons for that, as we can see in this case. Stalin obviously did not want to follow the mistake that some of the Germans did of leaving very direct instructions of what was happening, numbers, records, whatever. So in the German system, we we have that whole numbering. The Germans were very ordered. They had numbers of who each person was, how many, like getting their daily quotas and, and what whatnot. But with Stalin, he, he at least realized like, okay, if this all turns around, I could be painted as a very bad guy. So it's better not to have direct evidence of me saying these things, but make it with known with my words and directly to subordinates. This is what I want to happen. This is what should be happening. And while that leaves a bit of wiggle room for the subordinates and, and other people to not do exactly what he wanted, it also leaves the wiggle room for him to turn around and say, oh, no, I didn't say any of that. That, that wasn't my idea. A chilling and very depressing prospect when you think of what the actual outcome turned out to be. We read in Izvestia for May 24, 1959, that Yulia Romanetsva was confined in the internal prison of a Nazi camp while they tried to find out from her the whereabouts of her husband, who had escaped from that same camp. She knew but refused to tell. For a reader who is not in the know, this is a model of heroism. For a reader with a bitter gulag past, it's a model of inefficient interrogation. Yulia did not die under torture and she was not driven insane. A month later, she was simply released, still very much alive and kicking. <sighs> this is where you get in some deep, dark territories and the book starts hitting a pace where it, it's hard to, to read on, really. In this case, he's talking about the comparisons between the gulags and the Nazi camps. And what he's simply saying here is that the Nazis did not know how to torture. They did not know the extents and the limits that could be pushed to break a person to make them talk. And in a way, he's comparing the Nazis favor favorably to, to, the, to the Soviets in, in saying that, you know, they were, they were too kind-hearted. They were too lenient with her they didn't go to the full depths of depravity of torture of what is possible for a human being to inflict on a, upon another and that i suppose speaks volumes not only about the nazis but also about the soviet system and the gulags although others might not be aware of it it was clear to the interrogators at least that the cases were fabricated except at staff conferences they could not seriously say to one another or to themselves that they were exposing criminals. Nonetheless, they kept right on producing depositions page after page to make sure that we rotted. So the essence of it all turns out to be the credo of the Blatny, the underworld of the Russian thieves. You today, me tomorrow. That is honestly one of the most brutal, harshest, anti-human things I've ever read. He's in this case, he's talking about the the people who were doing the interrogations, the arrests, the organs of the of the Communist Party. And what he's saying there is basically these people knew that they were arresting innocent people. They were throwing in people who had done nothing wrong into this system of torture, of pain, of uh, servitude, of whatever you want to call it. And while being very much aware of this, they also had the thought that 
okay, I can't do anything about this. And even realizing that in all probability, they're going to be next. And that credo, you today, me tomorrow, is just, I, I have no words to express how deeply resentful, how deeply tragic, how deeply moving that that sentiment is of like, we're in such a bad situation, but I'm still going to claw after myself one more day of freedom, one more day of joy, one more day of whatever. And even though I know my time is coming, at least it's not today. And unlucky for you, your, your day is today. So join the system, join the torture, join the, the one of millions in this painful, disgusting system. If only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? For anyone who is a follower of Jordan Peterson, they will have heard this quote, this line that he takes from the book. This is not the only place he, he makes that same analogy of a, of a line dividing the heart. It also appears later in the book. But it's just interesting, I suppose, the, the final part, that question he asked to himself. And who is willing to destroy a piece of their own heart? One of the things as humans is we have to acknowledge that we've got bad stuff in us, the good and the bad. And it is a very, very painful process to remove parts of your own personality. I know myself, I've been through some very uh, traumatic times where I've had my identity fixed to one point. I was this soccer player. I was doing this. I was this type of person. And then you do something which proves to yourself that either you're not that or you're the complete opposite of what you thought you were. And this can appear out of nowhere. This can be something that just happens to you or it can be something that you create as well. And I, I think like the driving point of this is that that line that divides the, uh, the human heart, that divides evil in, in the human heart, we all need to accept that it's there and push it to consciously push it to the point where the evil is minimized and the, the good, the, the happiness, the joy, the better parts of all of us are, are the parts that fill up our heart and our soul and our being and the way we act to one another. Furthermore, so that the interrogator shouldn't get disturbed, it was also announced that the days spent on hunger strike by a prisoner under interrogation should be crossed off the official interrogation period. In other words, it should not only be considered that the hunger strike had not taken place, but the prisoner should be regarded as not having been in prison at all during the period of the strike. Thus the interrogator would not be to blame for being behind schedule. Let the only perceptible result of the hunger strike be the prisoner's exhaustion. One of the only ways a prisoner can really rebel against the system is by taking a stance on himself and, and instituting something like a hunger strike, non-cooperation. And this little point here just drives very to the heart of the whole system that they created there, which was to take responsibility, to take blame and put it elsewhere and create misery at the same time by doing this. So not only were these innocent people being put in jail, being put in terrible situations, their, their only solution to it, the hunger strike, that is probably one of the only ways people in general who are locked up can get some sort of attention, can get some sort of recognition was in fact, only making it worse for themselves by making them exhausted, by showing that no, not only is it not even hurting the system, the system can accommodate and make it so that the end result is only even worse. The, the interrogators don't get blamed for being behind schedule. They uh, actually just have an easier job now because the prisoner is weak or from their own self-imposed hunger strike and will be more willing to capitulate. So... It's another terrible aspect of, of what this system managed to create. No, it would be unjust, most unjust, unfair to compare this most savage construction project of the 20th century, this continental canal built with wheelbarrow and pick with the Egyptian pyramid. After all, the pyramids were built with the contemporary technology. 
and we use the technology of 40 centuries earlier. That's what our gas execution van consisted of. We didn't have any gas for the gas chamber. Here's Solhenitsyn's talking about a canal built between two bodies of water in the Russian tundra. And he's just comparing it to the, the building of the Great Pyramids where it was done pretty much with slave labor. And if you've seen any videos or know anything about the way the pyramids were built, it was absolutely horrific. And here he is comparing it what they were doing with with the with the Egyptians and saying, you know what, at least the Egyptians had the the smarts the, to use contemporary technology to to try and make the work easier. But no, what these projects were, these construction projects, not only were they to build something, to build the the Soviet Union into a grander, more better place in in quotations, but it was a way of of killing people. It was a way of killing people through hard labor, through work, and there was no immediate reaction such as was caused by the Germans putting him in the gas chambers. No, the, the, the Soviets had a, a way of doing it in a much more prolonged way. These, these, um, these attackers, these betrayers, these um, political people who want to take down the communist system, which is the you know, everlasting, only good system that we've created these people need to suffer and boy did they suffer just as always in our well thought out social system two different plans collided head on here too the production plan whose objective was to have the lowest possible expenditure for wages and the mvd plan whose objective was to extract the largest possible earnings from camp production to an observer on the sidelines it seems strange why set one's own plans in conflict with one another Oh, but there is profound meaning in it. Conflicting plans flatten the human being. This is a principle which far transcends the barbed wire of the archipelago. As you read this book, you get deeper and deeper into what it was that made the socialist system, this thing that they created, the archipelago, so brutal, so destroying, soul destroying for the people that went into it. And this is just another a little addition of of what it was, the fact that they would have these competing ideas, these completing plans pushed and forced together where one day they would be told one thing, one day, the next day they'd be told another thing. And there was never any certainty of what was going on. This was also very true of the arrests that were happening. They would arrest people and then there would be, oh no, this is, this could just be a mistake. We'll look through the process. We'll, uh, we'll fix this out. Don't you worry. We'll be all right. And this would make the people sort of weaker and tamer. And then eight days later, there would be an interrogation again. And he would be saying, no, look, you signed this document. You said this, blah, blah, blah. So it just gets, and this quote is just another addition of the soul destroying aspect of, of how deep the Soviet system got and what made it so brutal, so hard to, to tolerate. Corpses withered from Pellegra, no buttocks and women with no breasts, or rotting from scurvy, were checked out in the moor cabin and sometimes in the open air. This was seldom like an autopsy. A long vertical cut from neck to crotch, breaking leg bones, pulling the skull apart at its seam. Mostly it was not a surgeon, but a convoy guard who verified the corpse. To be certain, the Zek was really dead and not pretending. And for this, they ran the corpse through with a bayonet or smashed the skull with a big mallet. And right there, they tied to the big toe of the corpse's right foot, a tag with his prison file number, under which he was identified in the prison lists. Ezek is a prisoner who was entered into the Gulag system. And this just goes to show how brutal they were when it came down to the very fine details of, of what was really important to the socialist system. Was it that everyone was good and happy and that they shared things equally? No, no, it was more the negative aspects. It was the, the, the prisoners, the political people who, uh, you know, offended or were trying to break the communist system. These people would not be given a little ounce, a chance of escaping, a chance of an iota of sympathy. And so you could see this where they were dead. They were dead. They were on the ground freezing from whatever disease it was they contracted while working through the winter, the harsh winters, the, the just unending hours of physical labor. 
and not even were their corpses left in peace, but they had to make sure that these per people weren't just trying, faking dead or faking trying to get away. No, we have to crush their skulls. We have to bayonet them to make sure that they're not dead because not one single person who is a, a prisoner, who is a, a person who wants to destroy the Soviet system can escape. And like, that's just, it's just disgusting. What, what, what more can you say? The children in a collective farm club got out of hand, had a fight and accidentally knocked some poster or other off the wall with their backs. The two eldest were sentenced under Article 58. On the basis of the decree of 1935, children from the age of 12 on had full criminal responsibility for all crimes. They also sentenced the parents for having allegedly told them to and sent them to do it. A 16-year-old Chuvash schoolboy made a mistake in Russia in a slogan in the world newspaper. It was not his native language. Article 58, five years. There was absolutely no mercy in this system and you could see that from these little snippets that I just read there. Even children from the age of 12, 12, had full responsibility for their crimes and could be sentenced up to 25 years. It's sad, but in parts of the book, he's talking about how they'll flippantly say, oh yeah, he got a tenner or he got a quarter referring to the actual number of years that they gave out to people, 10 years and 25 years. It just astounds me to, to even hear that kids and people could be treated like this. Just uh, unbelievable. But it was not the number of years, not the empty and fantastic length of years that made these second terms so awful, but how you got them, how you had to crawl through that iron pipe in the ice and snow to get them. It would seem that the arrest would be nothing for a camp inmate. For a person who had once been arrested from his warm domestic bed, what did it matter to be arrested again from an uncomfortable barracks with bare bunks? But it certainly did. In the barracks, the stove was warm and a full bread ration was given. But here came the jailer and jerked you by the foot at night. Gather up your things. Oh, how you didn't want to go. People, people, I love you. In this part, Solhenishin's talking about how people in the camps could get second terms for doing absolutely nothing wrong. This time there was absolutely no pretense of a farce because how, how could they do uh, political contrivings against the communist system when they're already in the jails? But nevertheless, they feared the second term just as much as they feared getting arrested for the first one, which just goes to speak of, of how brutal the punishments were, that it wasn't even the length of the years, it was more how it was done it seems like no matter how bad humans get, there is always a point where something can be done to make it worse for oneself. The thieves, the Erki, are not Robin Hoods. When they want, they steal from last leggers. When they want, they are not squeamish about taking the last footcloths of a man freezing to death. Their great slogan is, you today, me tomorrow. We're once again here seeing the repetition of this you today, me tomorrow theme. And in particular, he's referring to the thieves here. The thieves are I will, what I would call the actual criminals, the people who actually murder, rob, or rape, or whatever it is, who in by any definition of the normal standards of, let's just say, our society, of Western society, we would say, okay, yeah, they need to be in jail. They have done something wrong. And these are the people who are mixed in with the political prisoners, the people who are innocent and actually did nothing wrong. Uh, and I guess those in-between ones where they, may, they maybe actually were contriving against the um, Soviet system or the communist system. And while not right, there was at least the excuse of this is why they're being put away in jail. So once again, just this repetition of, of this brutality, this nihilistic mindset of I'm going to do whatever I can to survive and it doesn't matter what happens to you because at least today it's not me. And none of the party prosecutors with children the same age shuddered. They found no problem in stamping the arrest warrants. And none of the party judges shuddered either. With bright eyes, they sentenced little children to three, five, eight, and ten years in general camps. And for shearing sheaves, these types got no less than eight years. And for a pocket full of potatoes, one pocket full of potatoes in a child's trousers, they also got eight years. Cucumbers did not have so high a value put on them. For a dozen cucumbers, Sasha Blokin got five years. I don't even know how to describe how it would be for a child to, to even understand this. 
they're sentencing children to lengths that are longer than they've actually lived themselves. It's it's just so ridiculous the the whole system that got put up there. And while reading this book, you you just become astounded more and more at what was actually going on and, and how they actually managed to do it. How how bad it was that inv- individuals couldn't protest against something that was obviously so out of whack, so out of touch with reality that they still couldn't have that individual courage and fortitude. And I'm not saying that they should have, but there is something to be said about at least just analyzing that system that got in place and how how much of an individual responsibility there was for creating it and how much of an individual responsibility there also needed to be for the dismantling of it. And as sad as it is, it seemed like it took the death of Stalin to actually put the 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 foundations i suppose were already crumbling but it required just this one act of what luck of of crazy luck that this this dude just died when he died instead of living for an extra 30 years and on the whole do you know i have become convinced that there is no punishment that comes to us in this life on earth which is undeserved superficially it could have nothing to do with what we are guilty of in actual fact But if you go over your life with a fine-tuned comb and ponder it deeply, you will always be able to hunt down that transgression of yours for which you have now received this blow. Once again, if you've listened to any of Jordan Peterson, you will recognize this this quote of the fine-tooth comb picking over his life in a fine-tooth comb. He actually took this from another prisoner, a doctor, who told this to him when he was sick and um, I I believe he had cancer or, or something was very wrong with him and he was very ill. And this, this picking over the fine tooth comb, just this idea, it's interesting to know that he didn't actually come up with it himself. He got it from another person. And in the abridged version that I'm reading, he doesn't particularly say about how he did it to himself. So it's, un, it's unclear whether he actually did that or not. Maybe if I read the, the full three volumes, I'll, I'll get a bit of a better picture on that. But just that idea, I suppose, is a very empowering idea. It takes you out of the victim mentality and... It's as sad as it sounds, even if you're innocent, you can still use that to better yourself in the future. I I, I would say it's it's like a psychological trick, which while not true, ends up putting yourself in a better position if you take on that responsibility and saying, look, even though I got sentenced to 25 years for doing nothing wrong, what did I do wrong in this, you know, previous versions of my life in this, in the lead up to this? which put me here and granted this is more of a psychological tool i would say for adults if you told that to a child that then it's not going to be any help to them but for adults i think it's a very powerful tool to be able to to look at yourself and then say okay what put me here why did this happen and what can i work on now that i am here the camp soon had its own announcers programs included the latest news and news features there was also a daily wall newspaper with cartoons Crocodile Tears was the name of a program ridiculing the anxiety of the MVD men about the fate of women whom they themselves had previously beaten up. This is in reference to a camp mutiny, a strike that occurred in one of the the main camps that there was, where prisoners basically took over parts of the camp, took over the, the storage shed with the food. They had no arms or munitions, and they were still enclosed in the camp they were in. But they managed to gather enough just manpower force to actually force the guards back. And they basically had this this standoff with the guards for I think about 40 days until the army actually came in with tanks and demolished the whole thing, took everyone properly prisoner again, even though they were still prisoners, and and I guess like quenched that little rebellion. This, I goes just goes to show like the, the humor that, that Solhanishan actually managed to put in this book, even though it treats with such depraving, brutal, cruel themes, he still managed to put some little bits of sarcasm and humor in here, which add to the book, add to the, the liveliness of it that, that make the story way more relatable. On the very next page of this, he talks about how the prisoners were trying to send out these uh, like leaflets these envelopes to the neighboring towns the neighboring villages to let them know that no the propaganda against us isn't true that we're not actually beating the women in the camps we're not the ones murdering raping 
blah, 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 that everything that the, the system is saying that we're doing. And so to stop, to do this, they put up kites into the air and then would drop the leaflets from that. And the, the guards actually had this system where they would try and shoot holes in the kites, but it didn't work that well with guns. They, so they actually had a counter kite system, which they would use to send up their own kites and tangle the strings and pull them down. So even though this whole chapter is just full of, well, the whole book is just full of tragedy and dismay, there's still little moments here and there of, of liveliness, of joy, of happiness, of ridiculousness that actually make the book, you know, manageable to read rather than just a depressing, solemn tome. There used to be a saying, the hard times brace you and the soft times drive you to drink. Sometimes a man's teeth would all fall out in a year. Sometimes he would grow old overnight. Another man's strength would give out as soon as he got home and he would die burned out. We come to the end of the book here where he's talking about prisoners getting released under the reforms of once, once Stalin died. And especially this, this notion he has where the prisoners, the Zex who had fought for so long, fought for their lives day in, day out against the brutality, the cold winters, the forced labor, the starving, the, the hunger, the uh, deprivation just in total of, of warmth, of love, of humanity, of everything. He's talking about how once that, that system was taken away from them, their body couldn't hold up to what they had tolerated. The, the mind was able to, when they had something to fight against, something to, to continually battle. But once that was gone, the, the effects of, of everything caught up to them and basically just destroyed them. He's not saying this happened to everyone. And he goes on to talk about how other prisoners would just get out and that first year would just be a pure bliss, pure freedom and joy knowing that they weren't in this system anymore. And I suppose it just goes to show how how bad and how, how strong the human mind can get. When you're facing against something, it is possible to just fight and fight and fight to the death. And then once that that thing that you're fighting a, a, a way goes away or or your, your reason for continuing goes away, that's when the body can just disintegrate and not keep up what it used to be doing. So those were some of my favorite quotes, some of my favorite passages from the book and things that really hit home to me and, and made me question and look into, I suppose, my own actions and the, own, the system I currently live in and, and really have a think about what can I do to make sure that something like this never happens again because as far as I can tell, that is the closest thing psychologically and probably physically to hell that I could imagine. So thank you for joining me on this little bonus episode and I wish you all the best. Let me know if you enjoyed. If not, also let me know. <laughs> so that's it for today. Karen out.